Okay, welcome back. Uh, today I want to talk about, uh, you know, continue to talk about memory corruption and then I'm going to talk about side channels as well. Um, so everything that I say today until the point that I start talking about side channels will be part of your quiz. Okay, so like, you know, for the first, you know, probably 20, 30 or maybe one hour. Uh, would be part of your quiz. And then the second part, when we start talking about side channels, won't be part of your quiz. I'll also talk a little bit about your quiz uh, when we move forward. I'm going to do the participation uh, during the, the break. Uh, but let's go back into the last thing that we discussed uh, uh, the last part of uh, Monday uh, about memory corruption attacks. Uh, if you remember what I said that uh, was that the idea in memory corruption is uh, we are using the system normally, so we're not changing the environment, we're not creating faults, but what we're trying to do is that we are trying to manipulate some existing problems and bugs that exist in the, in the system, in the design of the system, in the design of the software, and, and we're going to use that in order to gain some advantage, okay? Uh, uh, one of the things that we can do is hijacking the control flow. And that's where we start the idea of buffer overflow and how buffer overflow works. Um, we uh, we start with like giving a little bit of quick background. Uh, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with buffer overflow, but let's see how many of you have heard buffer overflow before Monday. Okay. So I would say half, half. So memory layouts, this is like regular, uh, most of, you know, uh, modern systems has a memory layout like this for per process. Uh, for each process, you have a copy of this over and over. Uh, you know, you usually you know, design your memory into different sections. Uh, each one is responsible for something. Uh, the important parts that you need to pay attention to is this heap and uh, stack. That grows in the opposite direction, and they are dynamic part of your memory, used very, very you know commonly and and and, and dynamically during execution of a program. Because obviously, you don't just need some static part for your memory for your process to grow. You need to like write data and read data, call functions, and you know return from functions and all those things. And heap you and heap and stack actually handles these kind of you know, like, you know memory related activities. Uh, uh, the biggest uh, thing that, you know, the most important things to remember and the main reason that we have something like buffer overflow is because we have call and returns. Uh, I'll talk, talk to you about the way that, you know, program works that, you know, essentially we have the CPU here and we have our memory here. Uh, and uh, CPU has this official register called PC, which essentially just points to some part of the memory. And what is happening is that whatever it points to, we're gonna read that one line of memory. We're gonna bring that instruction back into uh, my core. Uh, we're gonna bring this back into within my core and I'm gonna execute that instruction. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna then add PC to the next value, PC plus one, go back to the memory, bring the next line. This is like, for example, if this was PC, this is PC plus one. I'm gonna bring this back into my core and this the story continues. So we just kind of like, you know, creating a loop of, of reading one instruction, executing it, reading the next instruction, executing it and so on and so forth. What happens with uh, something like this when we have like a call? So if you have an instruction like this, like call or or jump, I mean, depending on which ISA you're using, but there's like usually something like this somewhere in your program. So you have a bunch of different instructions and one of them is this call. So what is happening really here is that instead of like doing like PC, PC plus one, PC plus two, PC plus three, uh, your memory would look something like this, that, you know, this would be, for example, your main memory instruction. So this is kind of like, you know, what you do. And then somewhere else in your memory, maybe here, somewhere down, 
this is where the beginning of foo is, okay? This is another function that you want to call. So if this, for example, call is here, what is happening is that I'm not gonna add PC, PC plus one and execute this next instruction here. I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna change the PC from here to the beginning of here. And I'm gonna start executing this. At the end of this, I will get the return. The return is basically then it's going to jump back to this address. Okay. So it's kind of like you take a detour, run things, and come back. And all this is just by manipulating the PC. Okay. Um, and then not just we manipulate the PC, I also told you that there are some other rules that we need to follow. For example, we need to save you know all the local variables for the for the main function. We need to kind of save the stack pointer by knowing where the stack the base pointer of the stack was. Uh, and if there is any sort of things that we want to pass through the new function. So for example, you call function foo with like, you know, A, B and C and D and things like that, right? So you have a bunch of different inputs to that function. Uh, you either can pass this by registers or you can push them into the stack and then, and then the, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the, the, the foo function, we're gonna read this from the stack. Uh, we typically like you know just do the first two or three to the registers and rest of the local variables will be will be pushed into the stack depending on which type of system are we using x86 arm and so on and so forth. okay so this is kind of <coughs> excuse me this is kind of like set of rules for the call layer and the call lead this is like you know uh the main function and the foo function um uh, uh this is like basically your main and this is your foo. So before actually doing anything else, you need to kind of make sure that you're doing these things. And uh, this essentially means that your your uh, memory and particularly your stack would look like this. This would be parameters for the main function. These are the old things uh, before actually this, you know, this call happens. So if we didn't have this call, all these things below wouldn't wouldn't have existed, okay? So your your stack would have been just a function and and things above. Okay, so now that we are calling the foo, uh, we're going to add these additional things. We're going to add uh, this parameters. These are the local parameters that are going to be passed to foo. Uh, we're going to store the return address so that we remember where it should be come back to. Uh, and then we're gonna save the base pointer for this function. And then anything else would be basically foo's variables, okay? There's anything that foo wants to use from this point downwards is whatever you want to use in the foo function, okay? For example, if you have tens of different local parameters, all of them will be basically grow this way, okay? And then stack, as I said, can grow basically as much as they want, okay? So, and and then, so if you have, if you want to, for example, load a big array of 1,240, you know, bits, uh, this grows, you know, that much, okay? So you kind of, stack is something that's kind of grows and shrinking, you push and you pop and so on and so forth, okay? So that's kind of like the idea of where we are. The part that is very, very important is this return address because that's where we're gonna know where should we jump back to, right? If uh, if I don't know this return address, when I'm reaching to the end of the foo function, then I don't know where to return to because remember, we need to return back to where I was called, right? So that we can continue executing the program. If I don't know what this address is, then I'm lost and I'm gonna lose control. Okay, and that's exactly what the attacker will do, that the attacker tries to overwrite this return address, okay? So that's what, what we're trying to do. Uh, okay. So what are we doing exactly? We're going to do this trick that we know that I told you that this part downwards is essentially the part that the foo function can uh, control, right? And let's say, for example, for this particular example, we have a local, you know, variable that called buffer. Okay, and whenever we are defining this, for example, think about the C language that we usually the most vulnerable to this uh, memory corruption attacks. For example, you will have something like int, I don't know, buffer, uh, 
and 20 or something like that. Uh, although this is like 20 bits and this is 20 bytes. So the syntax doesn't match, but for now, just imagine that each element within buffer is just one bit, okay? So when we are having this, uh, the compiler will you know, change this with some form of a push into the stack, and then they're gonna push it 20 bits down. So basically the, the, the stack pointer is here. After this instruction, the stack pointer gonna go and point to here. So we're gonna add 20 bits of, of storage area for that thing to go there, okay? So, so far so good. And then if you're right, like writing to buffer one and buffer two and so on and so forth, uh, things are gonna go inside this, this buffer one by one. And then if you want to read it, you're gonna read it from here. And when you're freeing it, this part will be freed. And, and that's the normal execution of, of a program. We are happy. But the interesting thing is happens when the adversary tries to do something like buffer 21. Okay. So what will happen at this point? If, if the adversary tries to do buffer 21, what will happen? Technically, buffer 21 is the address above this, okay? Because remember, the address just kind of goes upward. Uh, so buffer 21 means somewhere in this base point, okay? In a normal system, if you don't have bugs and if, you're, if you check your bounds correctly, this will result in segmentation faults and you won't be able to do that. But there are many, many functions, uh, standard functions like SDR copy, uh, and, and many others uh, that uh, they're unfortunately don't check how much you're supposed to write. For example, if, if I want to do something like SDRCMP, uh, I would like, you know, say like buffer and maybe some, some other character like A or B, and I'm gonna basically copy this A to this, uh, to this buffer, okay? So I'm gonna read a string, for example, from the input, and then I'm gonna copy it into the buffer, okay? And you would expect that this has to be at most 20, for example, characters or whatever, right? But what if the attacker actually, instead of sending 20 characters, send 40 characters? If you don't check your bounds, then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna, you're gonna overwrite many, many things in addition to the buffer, okay? So not gonna write the 20 characters or the 20 bits, you're gonna write another 20 bits. And what are you writing? Because you're growing in this direction, you're writing your base pointer. And at some point, you're going to start writing and overwriting the return address as well. Okay. So basically, you're kind of damaging. It's kind of like a flood that goes up and it's going to damage your entire stack. And the important thing is that it's going to, at some point, it's going to also overwrite your return address. All right. And that's where it's, you know, things are going to get really interesting because if I can overwrite the return address, I can technically overwrite it with anything that I want as an adversary, okay? So I don't want it with some garbage or some random number. I'm gonna write it with something that I want to. For example, going back to the example, I told you that you know your main function is kind of sitting here. Your foo function is somewhere here. Maybe the adversary wants to have another malicious function here, the malware. And this has some address, let's say 0x1000. I'm just making up numbers. So when I was calling, I was somewhere here, I was calling and going here, right? And say, let's say this address was like 0x55, uh, okay? So the return address that I was saving here was 0x55. And I was supposed to, when I reach to the end of foo, I go to 55, right? But what I can do is that if I can overwrite this, I'm gonna overwrite it, for example, with 1000. And what will happen then? It will, when I reach to the return address in the foo function, I'm gonna go and read this address. I have no idea this has been overwritten. And I'll say, okay, I should jump to this address. And that means that the return function of foo essentially just hands in the, the control to the adversary, right? So the adversary is going to say, okay, thank you so much. I'm going to start executing my code and then I can do whatever I want within this code. And that's where you basically take the control. You hijack the control flow and then you start executing malicious things. Okay. That's kind of the idea with the buffer overflow. Uh, so essentially the reason that we have buffer overflow is that we are using this bug that there is some local variables 
that is not being properly bound checked. And as a result, if the adversary can find this bug, it doesn't exist in every single code that you write, but exists in many enough of these codes that this actually becomes a very serious problem. And, and as a result, you can actually do something like this. Okay. Any questions? Um, very good question. For now, we are assuming that this code already existed and the adversary knows where it is. Then we're going to actually make it a little bit more advanced and show that what if I don't have this code or I don't know where it is? What can I do? We're actually going to get to that as well. Yeah, we can patch things together. We can also inject it. The first thing we're going to talk about is how to inject your own code as well. Yeah. Oh, so, does the packer know like how big is the buffer? Like, is it a two adversary? The, uh, the assumption is that the, advers the adversary has access to the foo function, okay? Foo is open source. So you, you can actually scan the code and know where exactly the, 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 the vulnerabilities are and so on and so forth. But even if you know the code, like, you know, like, does that happen now, like, which, like the machine code? Uh, why would you need the machine code? Like, and how is it overriding? Like, how is it? So, you know, for example, so you, so when I, if I give you a, a piece of code, an assembly or C-level language, you can compile it and you can know exactly how your stack look like. That's uh, that's very simple to do. Yeah. It's the, the behavior of the stack is deterministic. The compiler actually does it for you. All right. So, so now let's actually do a little bit more extra about the attack. So for now we assume that I, ha I should kind of planted my code somewhere into the memory and I should know where it is, okay? But unfortunately, the story doesn't end here. The story actually, the attack is much more sophisticated. And as I said, this is like one of the oldest problems in, uh, in memory security and harvest uh, in general computer security. As a result, the attack surface is also very, very sophisticated, okay? So what we can do is, uh, uh, we can, uh, the first thing we can do is instead of jumping somewhere in the program that is kind of like run only one particular program that I want, a particular malicious program, what if I jump and run something that I, then I can give me an unlimited amount of program executability capability? It's kind of like, you know, you have three wishes and you wish that you wish you know, the first wish is that you have unlimited wishes. That's kind of like what the attacker tries to do. So what do they do is, this is what we call a shell code attack. Essentially what the attacker tries to do here is this, instead of jumping into that one malicious program, whether it's a ransomware or a virus or whatever it is, we're gonna open a shell. We're gonna open a terminal as an adversary. And if I can open a terminal, then I have, it's like, you know, I, I, I have full remote access to, to a computer. I can go through the files, I can go through the folders. I can download something if I want to. Essentially a shell is this program, I mean, for, for Linux, obviously, that, that gives you this ability to run basically anything that you want, right? So basically in Linux, what I need to do is that if I can open this bin.s, you know, slash sh, I open a shell, I now have access to uh, essentially infinite number of programs that I can run. All I need to do is just passing commands to the shell one by one, and then I can run anything that I want, okay? We typically call this a shell code attack, okay? And uh, what you need to do for this is kind of like, you know, just kind of knowing where your shell code is and then kind of jumping there. And shell code is usually part of your standard cell libraries. It's part of the, the system call. So there's actually an easy way to invoke a shell. All you need to do is kind of call a system call with bin sh as, as the parameters. It will open a shell. I'm not going to go through the details of like how to write a shell code, but actually if you Google it, 
it's only for like four lines of code that you can we can stitch together to actually open a shell. Okay, so that's one thing that the adversary can do. All right. Um, so we, we usually call it like you know stack smashing attack. So we find so the steps is basically this. We we need to kind of analyze the code, the source code, the victim code, and try to find a memory safety vulnerability. Of course. This doesn't mean that every single code that you write has this. Uh, some code does it and some code don't. Okay. Then I need to kind of like write this malicious, you know, shell code and 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 then kind of like do something to to uh, you know find where the shell is. Either I write some form of like you know small piece of code, or 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 as I'm gonna describe it later, I'm gonna inject it to the system. Uh, then I need to kind of do the actual attack. I need to overwrite the return address with the beginning of that address that I want. Uh, and then let's start the execution of the code, wait for the return to happen, and then boom, right? So once the return happens, the show will pops up, and then you can have the full access to the system. Okay. And that's that's where this thing happens. Um, so where and how do we store the shell code? Uh, the easy thing that we can do is that we can inject the code itself with the with the buffer overflow. How do we do that? Uh, remember, I told you that I can overwrite things, right? And I can overwrite it until the points that I have the return address. Okay. So I usually have this real state here. There's all these lines here that are essentially garbage, right? I just overwrite it with some random values until I hit the return address. And the return address is really the address that I want, okay? So the idea is that why don't I use this space to actually inject some meaningful code? And now instead of jumping to somewhere else in the program, I'm gonna jump here at the beginning of this thing that I, I personally as an attacker overwrite, okay? So we call this a code injection, kind of buffer overflow with code injection attack, okay? The shell code itself, which is just basically some like three or four assembly instruction that all it does is really calling a system call. It's only like, you know, four or five lines of memory at most. Uh, so it's really enough. I mean, in most cases, uh, you don't really need much of a space to, to overwrite this. So you put like four lines of code here. What you do in addition to that is what we call like a landing area. So the landing area is this that, you know, if I had only the buffer address and the shell code, okay? So if it was just the buffer, the, the buffer address and the shell code, what I need to return to write in this buffer address is the exact beginning of the shell code, okay? I really need to know where exactly this is, the very first line of my shell code is, okay? And for some reasons, this is a little bit difficult. So what I can do is that I can add this additional space if I have it, of course, and I call this landing area. And what is this landing area? This is just what we call a no, op, a no operation. And the trick is that the buffer doesn't need to be now exactly accurate. Anything in this area would work. So if I land here or land here or land here, uh, my attack still works because essentially it means that I'm going to run a bunch of no ops, which, is, which are no operations. Some of them, depending on how accurate my landing is. And then after some points, I'm going to start running my shell. Okay. So what is happening here is that this was my original, uh, let me write it here. So this was my original stack. I had my return address and I had a bunch of different things here, right? The adversary can overwrite everything here, okay? So what they do is that instead of like writing this part with garbage, they actually write this part with their shell code, which is usually very small and the rest with no ops, okay? And then the return address is, I'll call it the buffer address is pointing somewhere into this area, wherever from here, that will work, okay? And then that would be the attack that I'm gonna actually send. That would be the string I'm gonna send, for example, in the SCR copy. It's going to be some no ops, okay? And then the shell code, 
and then the buffer address. And I'm gonna call this A, and I'm gonna say SDR copy, for example, uh, you know, the buffer address or the buffer, the original buffer in A. And what this do is that it's gonna overwrite everything and overwrite the return address, but overwriting in a very intelligent way. Does that make sense? Any questions? Towards the left of the board, it says no slots left. Mm -hmm. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, this the area that I have no op operations. I call we usually call it no op slot. Yeah, and then this nine zero nine zero nine zero. This is for x eighty six. Uh, this is just you know the op code for the no. Okay. Uh. Just uh, think this is just the the, the output that you use for for for, for creating a node. This think about it as just I mean yeah, the assembly level this is no op no op, and then some instructions like add or xor and stuff like that. Uh, you don't need to know the exact assembly codes for this if you don't have uh, knowledge about that. But as generally the idea is that I don't want to do anything. I just want to have a kind of a cushion. That if I land in that cushion area, doesn't do anything. It just gives me the alignment that I want so that I can hit the shell code correctly at the beginning. Okay. Instead of like, for example, saying that I have to jump exactly five feet, I'm telling you that I'm adding, giving you three more feet that you can, like, you know, plus or minus three, you can jump and still you're active, right? So that increases your, your accuracy. Good. Any other questions? All right. So that's one thing we do. So we don't need to, as you can see, I didn't store anything in this in this attack, right? All I did was knowing what my shell code should look like, which is again, now it's common knowledge. You can actually, you know, Google it. Uh, you, you just need to know where this buffer and how long this buffer is. And whether the code that you are kind of dealing with has some vulnerability like this. Once you know it, everything else is just very simple to kind of pull off. Okay. Uh, another thing that you can do is that, you know, an easy fix to this is that if you make your stack inexecutable, okay, if you make it data only that you cannot run things in your stack then this attack won't work, okay? And that's kind of like something that very, at the very beginning when, when people saw this attack is possible, they did it, okay? So then the attackers start to become more creative. And what they did was the idea of what we call a code reuse attack, okay? So the code reuse attack is saying that I don't even for, for, for having a shell code, which basically was a combination of four or five instructions, okay? I don't even need to inject this. What I need to do is that if, for example, this first instruction is add and the second instruction is XOR or whatever, I'm just making an instruction. There are lots of instances of these instructions already in the memory. So what I can do is that if I somehow can stitch them together, then I essentially going to jump here, then jump here, then jump here, and then gonna keep jumping in you know different places, and I can run each jump is basically executing one instruction. Okay, so I'm not even injecting anything to 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 the uh, to the to the buffer uh, to the stack. I'm just just finding this chain of addresses that I need to jump one after another. Okay, so it's kind of like you know uh, like you know instead of like sending a character i'm going to send a c then i'm going to find the return address for h and then i'm going to return address for a and then an r and then so on so on. okay we call this a return oriented programming because it basically just works by returns uh, essentially you need what we call gadgets gadgets is what we call a series of instruction that ends with the return why it should ends with the return because if it ends with the return then you can jump to somewhere else in your in your memory, right? So for example, you have 
uh, pop EAX return, pop EBX return, move EX and, and the address of EX return, add return, pop return, move return. And actually, this is exactly the code. All you need to do in order to launch a shell is exactly this sequence of instructions. So it's not something that I randomly generated here. This is actually what you really need in order to uh, in order to jump uh, and, and invoke a shell. And what, what, how do I want find this? There are ways to kind of scan through your, your memory and find this. Uh, unfortunately, there are lots and lots of these gadgets already inside your memory, especially in the standard cells library in SDLs and LibC. Uh, so, you know, LibC is this, you know, standard list of, you know, function like printf, and scanf, all these, you know, standard functions that you use in your programs. Uh, these are part of a, a library called LibC. And what they found is that even if the only, the, all they need to do is a scanning LibC and they're going to find all these things that they want. Okay. So they, they didn't even need like additional programs or whatever. Uh, they can easily find that. And all they need is this addresses. Okay. This is the beginning of this. This is the beginning of this and so on and so forth. They're going to just, instead of overwriting the this, this stack with random garbage, you can, you can overwrite it with these numbers. And these are the beginning of each uh, kind of like patch, each, each gadget. And then I'm going to stitch them together. I'm going to run them one by one. So I jump to the first one. These two will execute. It's going to return. How does it return? It goes back to the stack. See what is the next return address, which basically points into here. And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and then boom. I can run anything that I want. The interesting thing about this ROP style attack is that this is actually Turing complete, which means that you can actually run anything that you want, not just uh, invoking a shell. You can actually run a very complex program using just return oriented program. Okay. Which means that this is very, very powerful uh, in, in attacking your systems. Okay. If you're interested, definitely go and read. Uh, we have actually two papers in your paper readings this week that we're going to present next week about different types of you know return-oriented programming and jump-oriented programming. Uh, so that's the idea, and that's the that's the story about uh, uh, buffer overflow. Okay. Any questions? So how common is this? Is this uh, something like, you know, very rarely happens, like lots of things actually have, have to come together? No. Unfortunately, there are many, many unsafe functions and, and, and programs, especially legacy programs that's written in C and C++. Uh, and actually, the, the most dangerous software weakness, uh, you know, out of bound rights is actually the number two uh, of the biggest problems that we have in computer security at the software side. Uh, you know, the cross-site scripting is, is if, we, if you talk about, you know, network security, we will talk about that at some point. But uh, this out of one rights, which is essentially the cause for buffer overflow, is the second most common reason that systems are being hacked these days. Okay? So how do we defend against uh, buffer overflow? Because, of course, you know, people know about this and start thinking about, okay, how do we fix this problem? Uh, the answer to this is that different layers you can uh, you can actually fix that. Okay. Uh, before I just go into this, let's see if there is any kind of intuitive solutions that you guys might have. Why, how do you think we can we can solve this problem? Yeah, you shouldn't allow out of bound memory access. What's that? You shouldn't allow out of bound memory access. You should fix your codes, for example, right? So that's one thing, but that's, I mean, what if the code is already there? Like what if- I mean, like the OS or like whoever's managing the storage shouldn't allow, they should be protecting things like that. How though? So the question is how? Like the OS or the compiler can insert protection bits or fields for the parts of memory. Okay. Some protection bits, okay, yeah. I think I remember from like an old class, they like build in between, like they build in the stack, like in the stack, like with garbage. So like just empty, like completely empty things. So like, it's pretty impossible to like yeah. overflow that far. So you just have like, a, just a bunch of like filler. It's like kind yeah. of- We call it stack canary. If you put the canary, if you overwrite it, the canary is dead. So we know it. I'm going to talk about that. Yes. Any other suggestions? Uh, 
randomized addresses. Randomized addresses so that we don't know where the return address is, right? So randomizing it definitely helps. Anything else? All right, so let me go through them one by one. Uh, so of course, the, the first thing you can do is just write safe code, right? So there are new languages such as Rust and Java that's actually there are, you know, by design, they don't have this type of vulnerabilities out of band checks and so on, okay? And then you can have things like compiler checks, as you mentioned. Uh, then it goes through some form of like, you know, more involves, uh, you know, uh, defense mechanism, including the stack protection, control flow integrity, uh, pointer authentication, data execution prevention, and ASLR. So let me talk about some of them. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is what we call stack canaries, okay? So the idea is that if you remember the way that the stack works was we had this buffer, this local variables here. Then we had the, uh, uh, the, the kind of the frame buffer uh, or the, the pointer, right? And then there was the return address, okay? So what we can do is that I can, ex you know, change this to this. That I can have my return address and my pointer. Then I'm going to add this additional layer, which I'm going to call it a canary. And then I'm going to have my, my buffer, okay? So essentially, this canary has to sit between the buffer and the return address. And then what does it give us? It gives us this kind of assurance that if the return address is overwrite, it is guaranteed that the canary is already overwritten, okay? So if this part has been overwrite written, it means that everything up to this point has been overwritten. So this canary has been overwritten already, okay? So what, how can I use this? I can use this this way. Remember I told you that, you know, when I, you know, call foo, I start running things. At some point, I have this culprit, this instruction that's kind of like mess things up. And then I'm gonna just continue without actually even noticing that my stack has been overwritten. And at some point, I'm gonna get to the return address, right? So now what you can do is that just right before your return address, you can check your canary, the status of your canary, see whether your canary is alive or not, which means that whether the value that you originally written to to the canary is the same value that you're reading it from, okay? I need a separate storage for this, obviously, but if the value, for example, I, I just write a random value, like I write 100 here, but that's the value that I know and the adversary doesn't know, okay? If I can store this somewhere, obviously not in the same stack, but if I can write it somewhere, and then when I reach the return, I'm gonna check the status and see, is there still 100 in this line or is it some other values? If it's, if it's some other values, it means that it's definitely this stack has been overwritten. It's not the integrity of this stack has been violated. If it is 100, if, it's, if it is the same value that I think it was, then it's kind of safe Then I can, I can trust this, this, this stack, okay? So that's kind of like, you know, the, the basic idea of how the stack canary works. There are additional details as in like, how do I generate this random number? Where do I store it, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, you don't have to be worried about it, but that's kind of like the idea that you do, yeah. So why are return oriented programming attacks so so common then? Because like, it seems like this solution just fixes all of it, right? Like, is there a way to get around this? Yes. So do I have a slide for it? No, I don't. So stack canary doesn't work in many cases for various reasons. First, the adversary can also kind of like preserve this stack canary. So when I'm overwriting things, what I can do is that I'm going to save the stack canary, you know, the, the canary value. When I'm overwriting, I'm going to put it back in. Okay, so it's kind of like, you know, you go and steal something and then make sure everything is clean and then you come back. So it's like stealthy. The second thing is that I might be able to find what that value is, kind of, okay, beforehand. The third thing is that this stack canaries are not, you know, commonly used in many, many different systems. In some systems there is, and some systems there aren't. So there are different ways to kind of fool the system uh, by, by, by kind of circumventing this, this stack canary. 
Because unfortunately, if this value is still 100, it's not guaranteed that this stack hasn't been overwritten. If it's not 100, it is guaranteed. But if it's equal to 100, you still might have a, an attack. It's not a, like a cryptography secure type of like a Mac or something, right? It's, it's, it's just the value that you put there. So if the adversary finds that value, then your, your system is obsolete. Any other question? So that's one. Uh, but again, as I, as I just described, there are attacks for it. Uh, the other thing is what we call DEP, uh, data execution prevention. Uh, as I told you, the biggest issue that you have is that if the adversary not only like, you know, put the return address here, but also put their code here, right? Inject their code, which means that in order to run things, the, the stack is basically what we call executable, that you can actually read things from stack and you can execute it from stack, okay? And this is a, a, a very, very serious vulnerability because then essentially you're opening yourself to any sort of attacks because anything can be injected into the stack. So most of the common systems, most of the modern systems these days make your stack only readable and writable, but not executable, okay? I'm usually called this data execution prevention. Not only you can do that, you can actually also target some other parts of your memory as non-executable as well. And this will reduce the attack surface, the possibilities for the adversary to run things on those areas as well, okay? But on the other hand, there are disadvantages because sometimes you, as a normal users, you really wanted to run things from your stack. You really wanted to run things from part of the memory. So that's kind of like the trade off that we're playing. We're adding extra limitations on our systems, uh, but on the other hand, we are, we are kind of protecting ourselves from those type of attacks, okay? Uh, the second, the third one is what we call the address space randomization or ASLR. Remember I told you that, you know, for this attacks to work, I need to know, for example, where the return address is, right? And, and then I need to overwrite this with some correct value that I have, the beginning of that buffer address, okay? So I'm assuming that I know where the rest of things are storing, right? So I know where the beginning of my buffer, my malicious code is. Even if I'm using return-oriented programming, I should know the first part of this chain. So what I can do is that whenever I'm starting my, my, my computer, whenever I'm booting my computer, I'm gonna just shift things and move things, okay? So it's kind of like shuffling your hands anytime you're restarting your computer, okay? Or even during the, the, the use, usage of your computer. If I do that, then if the adversary knows, for example, that at the moment, this is the beginning of the address, let's say 0x100 or 1000, the next time that things resets, then it is guaranteed that this point is no longer the beginning of your buffer address. It's somewhere else, okay? So ASLR is actually a very, very common strategy to make things very, very difficult for the adversary. Uh, similar to stack canary, unfortunately, this can also be broken because there are ways that you can, for example, find some of the things. And once you find that, then you find the off offset for those. And then you essentially find everything that you have in your system. So it's like, you know, you have a map and you have no idea where different things is, but the moment, for example, you find where LA is, then you can just basically walk through the rest of the world, right? So uh, if I just shuffling this and, you know, turning it around, you cannot say, okay, LA is the same place that it was before, but the moment that you find things that you know where they are, then everything else you can easily find, right? So it's kind of like that's the basic idea how you can attack an ASLR, okay? Uh, and then final thing is what we call control flow integrity. So the control flow integrity is that I'm not gonna prevent, I'm gonna stop you know, thinking that I can, I can prevent these things from happening. What I do instead is I'm gonna say that I'm gonna, make sure that if there is an illegal jump, if there is some form of overwriting address, and if I'm jumping to somewhere else in my memory, I can, I'm able to catch this jump, okay? How do we do that? 
we design and 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 uh, find our control flow graph CFG. Okay. So for example, for a given code, I know for example my main should jump into foo. From foo, I should, for example, either jump back to main or maybe jump to another function and so on and so forth. So I'm going to design the basic block level mapping of my system. Okay. And we call this a control flow graph or CFG. Okay. And then if I have the full coverage of my design, that I know exactly all the possible kind of transition from one block to another block, what I can do is that. Whenever I'm here, I know that the only possible jump in this program is from this basic block to this basic block, okay? I know the address of this, I know the address of this. So if I see a change in PC, I'm gonna check it with list of known and possible jumps. If this one of those, then I'm happy and I'm gonna let this jump to happen. If this is not one of those, then I call this a violation, a potential attack, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this program or stop this and so on. So on, okay. So so I'm not preventing these jumps from happening in first place. Still, this might this jumps might happen and this might go somewhere else. But the moment I see this and I see this PC and I see that this PC is not part of valid PCs that I've seen before. I'm gonna, you know, report it and I'm gonna stop the program and do the proper actions as I need. Okay. So we call this control flow integrity. We're checking the integrity of our control flow, uh, CFI. Okay. How do we do that? Uh, two weeks from now, we might actually talk a little bit about attestation, control flow, and so on. You need to store a lot of things and you need to check a lot of things. Okay. So it's not. You know, trivial to do that, but it's possible to do something like that. Okay. Uh, so to to finalize the discussion for uh for memory attacks, this is unfortunately kind of as I said at the beginning, it's an internal war between vulnerabilities, fixes, new vulnerabilities, new fixes, newer newer vulnerabilities, and so on and so forth. So we found this about 20, 30 years ago. Still, we managed to, in 2020, I show you, this is number two, you know, concern for computer security. Because still it's going around, we, we do this ASLR and stack canaries, and then the attackers can find other ways to kind of circumvent the system, okay? Uh, yeah, I talked about the return-oriented programming. Uh, but there is not just control flow hijacking as a ways of, of doing buffer overflow. You can use buffer overflow or things similar to buffer overflow with the similar concepts in order to, you know, you know, corrupt your memory. There are things like integer overflow, heap string, use after free, format string vulnerabilities, and so on. So for the list is actually quite long. Uh, each one is kind of slightly different than the other. Uh, we don't have some time to go through them because this is not a software security class. But if you're interested, definitely go and take a look at these others. In 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 you know principle, most of them are basically doing the same thing. That there's some unbound or un, you know conditions that we don't check, and the adversary actually use that in their advantage in order to launch an attack. Okay, that's kind of like the fundamental idea in all of these. Uh, uh, if you want to learn more, this is a very nice kind of figure that kind of like, you know combine and look at all these pro different problems, uh, you know, buffer overflow, so on and so forth. Um, uh, this paper actually, this reference too, if you are interested, go and read it. Very nicely systemized this this different ideas, uh, so you can you can even talk about. It. The last thing that I want to talk about is how do we find bugs because. The root cause of all these is those bugs, okay? Uh, usually there are two ways of doing this. This goes very high level at the software level and software testing. We typically do something like binary analysis, as in we go through our binary and trying to find patterns or known issues in the binary, things like, you know, you know, unbounding checks and, 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 and conditions that we don't we violate and so on. Yeah. Another one is what we call symbolic execution, which essentially what we do is trying to generate different, you know, input patterns 
try to see what are the basic flux and control flow graphs, and then see if there are conditions that we sh shouldn't be there. It's kind of like, you know, okay, there is this, this path that leads into some conditions that, uh, that shouldn't be there. Um, I'm not going to go through these. Uh, again, this is a very nice topic for a software security class. So if you're interested, definitely go and take a look at them as well. All right. So that's it with uh, memory security. As I said, this is where we're going to stop for your quiz. This is going to be next week. So let's have a quick break. Once we are back, I'm going to talk a little bit about the quiz, and then I'm going to continue talking about side channels as the next step. All right, let's continue. Okay. So now I want to switch gears and and start talking about the new topic. As I said, this won't be part of your quiz one. It would be the first topic in your quiz two. Uh, so, so far, we talked about the impact that the physical environment or the adversity can have in uh, in the you know kind of like the outside or external part of the system, and that how it kind of propagates and translates into uh, some sort of faults or errors or problems. Right? We talked about the physical ones, right, and and essentially transduction attacks and fault attacks, right. And uh, we show that how they're possible at various different stages. We also talk about memory corruption as the way that we kind of send inputs, digital inputs. And these inputs are basically corrupting the system, right? So buffer overflow is nothing but, again, an interaction with outside war because you have to send some strings, some inputs to the system. And that string is basically gonna overwrite things in the memory and so on. So it's still some form of interaction, but this interaction is very different type of interaction that we've seen uh, with, with transduction attacks on fault attacks. If we don't you know, accept any input from the outside world from the users, uh, the, the buffer overflow or memory corruption won't happen at all, right? But unfortunately, we always need to kind of interact, okay? So now let's have a different perspective. And now let's think about what is the impact of computation on the open world, on the physical world. So far we talked about the physical world, the interaction and the impact it has on the computers, but the computer itself is a physical entity and it actually has impacts to their outside world, okay? And that impact is actually might be significant. Why? Because if I'm, you know, running different things in uh, in my computer, and that impact can be actually measured and seen in the outside world, then I can launch some form of information leakage attacks. That if I do like processing zeros versus processing ones, and if can somebody outside kind of measure some meaningful signals out of this, maybe they should be able to say whether I'm using zeros or ones, okay? The other things that we can do is that if there is a meaningful kind of impact in the physical world, I can use this as a means of, com com as a means of communication, which we call it, you know, covert communication. That in order to send something to the outside world, I run something digitally, create some physical impacts in the, you know, environment. And if somebody else can sense that environment, then they can actually receive my message, okay? And we call that a covert communication. I'm gonna actually give you more details uh, of how this would work, okay? So basically what we call this is physical side channels. These are unintentional artifacts of computing. The very simple example is the temperature of your computer. Remember I told you that if I change the temperature of the room, that might kind of change the sensors and readings of the sensors. But now what I'm saying is that if the temperature of your computer changes, and if the adversary can measure that temperature, maybe they can find some valuable information about your system. For example, if your computer is on versus if your computer is off, what is the difference between the temperature, 
right? Of course, the temperature, higher temperature means that you're using your computer, right? So basically the, the attacker can, by just measuring the temperature, can tell the existence of, of some active user in this program, in this system. But of course, maybe that's very poor screen. Let's actually go a little bit deeper. So let's, for example, say that if you're running application A versus application B, there is some temperature profile for application A, and there is some other temperature profile for application B. Maybe the, the B one is more, you know, computationally heavy. Like, you know, you're running your Chrome versus you're, you know, running a notepad or, you know, text, you know, editor. Uh, so if I manage as an adversary, manage to just measure the temperature, if I see a big rise, and if I know that, for example, you either run a text pad, uh, a notepad, or, or a browser, now I can tell whenever you are using your browser. Now I can do I even go one step further, and let's say I can even fingerprint which websites you're browsing. So within B, I can see B1 and B2 and B3. So for example, if you're loading a very heavy website versus maybe you know running a smaller website, maybe running a very small website, okay? So by again, by measuring the temperature, by knowing this profiles of these different websites that you're using, I can tell which websites that you're using. Maybe I can go even a further step further and whenever you're typing something, uh, based on the you know, keys that you are pressing, there will be surge of power. So if I see the signals, I will see something like this. And I will say, okay, this is one character. This is another character. This is another character. This is another character. So for example, your password is just four characters. I know the length of your password. Another thing that I can do is that maybe this is space. Maybe this is enter because they have different locations in the keyboard and so on and so forth. So essentially what I'm trying to do and what I'm going to describe in the rest of this lecture is this techniques that seemingly, you know, you think that you have the privacy and confidentiality because you run, you know, you type your things in, you know, does this a secure environment and your system is itself is secure, it's not interacting with anybody and so on and so forth. But because there are these unintentional signals, uh, Keep in mind that these are unintentional things like temperature or power consumption and things like that. You cannot have any control over it. Since these are unintentional artifacts that can be measured from some distance from outside the system, uh, the adversary can actually use this in order to leak some information about yourself. And we call this physical side channels attacks. Okay. This is the opposite of sensing because sensing you're actually, you know you know, sensing something from the environment. But this is basically from the computation, we are creating some physical signals in so the opposite direction. But still in order to sense that, you need some sort of sensors, but this sensors is the adversary sensors, not your sensors. And, uh, and then the reason that they exist is usually some physical uh, phenomena, right? Temperature, why we have temperature? Because, you know, switching is not the perfect activity. There is some loss of energy because of the switching. There's some, you know, energy propagated through the air and that's why you get heat, right? So CMOS is not the perfect switching device. Or why do we have change in power? Because the amount of currents that you're drawing from your, from your source for zeros versus ones is not the same. So there is a change in power and somebody can measure this, okay? So there are a whole bunch of different physical phenomena that you can use, uh, including the power, the sound and acoustic, electromagnetics, uh, temperature, time, that all creates as an artifact of computation unintentionally and adversary can measure this. And we call this physical side channels because there are some physical signals that attributed with this, okay? Any questions so far? So at what level are the physical side channels useful? Like for example, like in the condition of power, like you can measure at different levels, right? So you can measure at the power supply level or you can measure at like the CMOS level, like you said. So like where can you, at what point can you extrapolate actual good information from these things? That's very uh, case dependent. We're gonna give you some examples. You're gonna see some papers next week. I mean, the week after uh, of like the concrete examples. 
Uh, what I'm trying to show you here for now was the existence of such a channel. Of course, if you can extract more fidelity, then you probably can do more. But the short answer to your question is it's possible to do that in meaningful ways. 10 meters away and 15 meters away and so on. Any other questions? Uh, before jumping there, uh, so quiz would be uh, on Monday. It will be one hour, okay? It will be at the beginning of the class, uh, one hour. And then the format would be probably 10 to 20 true or false questions. And then five to 10 short answer questions, okay? Uh, the questions would be based on the le lectures and uh, the presentations, but not the papers. Uh, it will be posted on Gradescope, okay? So you can bring your laptop and notes and books. Uh, you can watch the videos if you want to. Uh, uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can, you can use anything that is available in the internet. Okay, but you cannot create new content. So you cannot type or post new questions. You cannot ask, you know, chat GP3 or similar, uh, uh, you know, so you cannot create new contents. But the contents that already existed, it's a fair game. You can use it. You can search Wikipedia and, and use it during your exam. If you're putting something in your answer, Try to paraphrase because we're going to check for similarity. And if you if you copy paste, for example, a sentence from Wikipedia, and if you see a bunch of people doing that, we think that you have cheated, and we're going to report it as cheating. Okay. So if you're copy and pasting things, paraphrase it. But as I said, that's fair game. You can you can copy and paste things. Yeah. Is it like we type on like grade scope? You can type or you can write and then take a picture depending on what you want. The, the the solution the, the questions would be digital uh and then uh the true or false you actually need to click on so bring your laptop basically okay. yeah yeah you can have not cold probably not if you would be i mean it would be short answer so like one line two lines yeah yeah no it should be here to take yes yeah. Um, is the coding assignment that student takes, or like, is that relevant at all if you're to the quiz? Uh, the coding assignment would be relevant, yes. Uh, I mean, we don't ask directly from the coding assignment, but it's talking about like things like encryption and, you know, using the same keys and XMRing, things like that. That would be relevant, yes. The true or false questions mostly would be very tricky. So we're going to like try to kind of fool you a little bit, and then you have to kind of figure it out a little bit. So be prepared for that kind of questions. It would be adversarial. <laughs> All right, any other things about the quiz? And then the presentation would be second half of the class. So those of you who will present on Monday also be prepared after the quiz, we're gonna do the presentations. So will the quiz only cover uh... Week one for the first group of presentations, or it's not, yeah, yeah, not things that we're going to say tomorrow. Of course, I mean, tomorrow, I mean, Monday, uh, because it's actually going to be after, right? So you haven't seen it yet. Any other questions? Okay, so that's one. Uh, the second thing is about the project. So I decided not to do your final project, so we no longer have that final project. Uh, it was a little bit of hassle of you know grouping, and then there are problems with like grading and stuff like that. So we're gonna have three CA assignments, okay? Uh, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna I'm gonna post another one next week, and then one last one in week eight or so, and then you have the final weeks to do it. It would be simple, okay? So no final groups. If you have already wor start working on it. That's great. If you want to work on it and substitute it with your project tree, you can, but your project tree would be much simpler. So, I mean, probably most of you won't do it. Any other questions? We good? All right. So let's continue talking about side channels. 
Uh, so there are two groups of side channels. There are what we call digital or slash macro architectural side channels, and there are analog slash physical side channels. The difference between the two is the way that we are measuring side channels. Uh, the analog or physical ones are the ones that we actually have like physical sensors for measuring it. Uh, electromagnetics, power, temperature, sound, these are the examples. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of digital side channels that I'm gonna talk about next week. And these type of side channels are actually not physical signals. They're actually activity within the computer that can be measured. For example, the cache level behavior, like cache miss versus cache hits, uh, memory reads, uh, TLB misses, macro artificial stalls, things like that can actually be measured by another process. And that process can use this information to read something from the other process. We also call that a side channel. Okay, I'm gonna focus first on this group of side channels in this lecture. Uh, probably we won't be able to finish it, but we're gonna finish that on Wednesday next week and I'm gonna switch into digital side channels, okay? Uh, the difference between the two is kind of like, you know, the way that we measure it. Uh, physical ones, of course, need some physical proximity to the device. Because for example, if you want to measure the temperature, you should have a sensor that can pick up the temperature from that device. Either you have very sophisticated sensors that can collect it from some distance, or you have to be very close to the device in order to pick it up. Uh, you need some measurement tool, uh, and, and we need to kind of like have, uh, you know, some way of, of measuring this, this signal. Uh, one important thing about the difference between the two is that, remember I told you that if you have some sort of interaction with the physical world, you are vulnerable to this to the to the different attacks. You're vulnerable to sensor attacks and fault attacks and, and memory attacks. So in order to fix this issue, there is a whole bunch of systems that we call air gap systems. This air gap systems means that they're not really connected to anything. Okay. So all these military computers and 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 like you know high-level and security sensitive you know systems and computers, they're mostly air gap. They're not really connected to the internet or they're kind of like actively reading things. If you really, they want to, they want to for example, connect to the internet, they have to go through lots of you know, steps, okay? And then the idea of these air gaps is that, okay, if I'm air gap, then I should be safe, right? Because there is no input to the system. So the adversary cannot really impact me. But this physical side channel attacks, they're actually breaking this assumption about air gap because even if your air gap, your temperature still leaks, so your electromagnetic signal still leaks, your power consumption still leaks. So those kind of things, you cannot do anything about them un unless you do some form of like very sophisticated shielding that in some cases they do. But in most cases, those things you cannot prevent from leaking, okay? So physical side channels are actually useful for even attacking air gap systems, okay? So that's one thing to remember. Uh, about physical side channels. So what is the goal in, in, in a side channel attack? The goal is basically finding something sensitive about the device, okay? So you're not trying to impact the availability of the system because you're not impacting the system. You're just collecting information from the system. So what you're doing really is just breaking the confidentiality, okay? You're just trying to extract. And what do you extract? In most cases, you are really trying to break the crypto, okay? Because cryptography algorithms are the same algorithms that you think that, you know, if, if we be implemented correctly, we cannot really break them. But I'm gonna show you a bunch of different examples to show you how physical sentence can be used for breaking the crypto algorithms, okay? So the whole business of side channels really is about crypto algorithms. Although these days are actually becomes any sensitive algorithm. So for example, there are attacks that shows that, you know, your weights in the machine learning system can be extracted, your password can be extracted, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just keys, but it's mostly just keys, okay? The, <laughs> the second use case for side channels is what we call data ex exfiltration which means that I'm gonna extract something from this air gap system. Remember I told you we want to make the system air gapped. So if it's air gap, you probably cannot steal information from it, right? 
but and then you cannot communicate with some other device but with side channels i can i can do that for example if i change the temperature and if i want to send one i change the temperature so rapidly and if i want to send zero i don't change the temperature or change the temperature a little bit what you can do is that by just measuring the temperature you can see that i'm sending a message to you right so i can send for example 110 would be high high and low okay that's how i'm going to send you a message right so even this system is not connected to the internet somebody sitting here with the temperature sensor and and some protocol that we agreed upon can see what sort of message i'm sending them okay there are plenty of examples there are like for example there's this paper that shows that from across the room you know across the street if you just do the blinking of your your hard drive if you change this blinking speed you can actually send like an information to the to the to the to the block away from you right so a whole bunch of things so you, you change the fan speed and then you send some information you change the you know pro, you know power consumption and you send some information there are lots of things you can do in order to send some information uh on on the systems okay so let me go a little bit more formal and, and define a little bit better. So in the physical side channels attacks SCA, uh, we have an X and F of X, right? So we have an input that we're really interested to know about. And there's this X goes through some form of function, right? So for example, the crypto algorithm, the F of X is an AES algorithm or an RSA algorithm, but as I said, it could be anything else. And what you're really interested to know about is this X, right? As an adversary, you're trying to find this. Uh, uh, and then how do you do that? This is basically becomes uh, kind of a like machine learning slash signal processing. So in, in its core, in its heart, side channel attacks problem is understanding security, but really if you want to extract things, it's really a signal processing problem. Okay, you're trying to extract something from a signal and you want to learn how that works. Uh, so before actually jumping into exact uh, examples, the three top of you know, physical side channels, uh, let me give you a quick kind of background and history of how the side channels become a thing. Uh, so it started in 50s, uh, right after World War II. Uh, uh, there was this, um, you know, uh, U.S. Army in New York City, I mean, in New York State, that they found that, you know, they have this kind of like a device, uh, electronic device, something like an oscilloscope. Uh, and then they, they had some radios a few blocks away, and they saw that they can actually pick up all the activities that they do within their labs from that office that they have a few blocks away, okay? And then they kind of like did it more carefully and so on and so forth. And they saw that they actually can basically, you know, pick up all the messages that they're sending and they were using some form of cryptography to encrypt it, but they saw that they actually can see like the you know, ups and downs very easily so they can actually recover the messages. Uh, they took it to, uh, uh, you know, Department of Defense and told them that this actually existed. At first they didn't believe and then there are stories that they actually demonstrate this in the headquarters of of the department of defense and show that okay we can actually see the messages but eventually that leads into what we call the tempest program which was uh uh you know this this secret programs in 50s that started in us that they found that all the electronics that they're using within the us government and the and the military should follow some set of standards to make sure that they are not leaking information in the form of electromagnetics. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, it's a code name, but generally it refers to you know technology involving monitoring of devices that emit electromagnetic radiation or EMFs. All right. Um, and then within 60s, they actually you know come up with, with actual standards. It then actually goes to NATO, and NATO also used that. But now it's it's a standard in any system in U.S. military that they have to be what's called tempest resistance. Okay. Uh, after this, there was a whole bunch of more user level and end user problems with side channels. Uh, the the most famous one is what we call you know a screen uh, freaking. What's what this you know scientist called Wanek 
well, what she, what he, they, they did was they have this big TV antennas, like this big ones, but has like a kind of like you know has multiple different rows. Uh, they show that actually, if this using this antennas close to the screens of televisions of people's you know TVs, uh, they can actually see the patterns and see what they're you know what they're seeing on, on their displays. For example, they show that you know if you type a character, they can read it and so on and so forth. And that was, you know, during the 70s and 80s, it was a big deal because displays and CRT is becoming like a big thing at that moment. And they show that you can, you know, collect the signals from some distance. And then there was the boom of credit cards in 90s. And again, very simply people show that they can actually find the if, uh, RFIDs in, in the credit cards and they can replicate credit cards with, with zero overhead. Uh, then there was a story of key logging and the fact that if you type things on your cell phones and your keyboards, people can actually collect it. And then, uh, of course, there always it was about cryptography keys and finding the cryptography keys. And these days it's also about some other applications, including machine learning rates and, and inputs and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, so now going back to uh how do we do it so i mean the, the the story was to to kind of give you this idea that you know science has been you know around for a very long time more than 50 years so so what we do what do we do want to do with side channels is that we want to find x out of f of x and if you remember for example for cryptography we always said that f of x is known to everybody because we're not doing security by obscurity Okay, that makes the life of the attacker much, much easier because they can actually do all these analysis on f of x and, and then try to see if they can find x. Okay, so that's really helpful for a physical side channels attacks, unfortunately. Um, so if you go back to you know cryptography algorithms, remember I told you that we have a plain text and a key, we have an algorithm and we have an implementation, all right? And so far in you know in week two. We extensively talk about why this is secure. We actually prove it for you. We show that this is actually kind of, you know, uh, anchored in some form of, you know, mathematical problems. And we were saying, okay, we are secure. So now we're adding a new angle to this. And then let's see what we can do if we have this additional side channels information, whether, whether or not that would be useful in order to attack the systems. Uh, there are three methods in order to use physical side channels. The first one was what we call a simple power analysis or simple analysis, uh, SBA or SEA, if we are using simple electromagnetic analysis. Uh, so what it does is just using simple visual examination of the signal. Okay. Uh, so for example, I'm showing a very simple, uh, you know, attack that has actually been used in real systems. Remember, we had, you know, a simple RSA algorithm, and we had this for loop that, you know, we do a square, and if D was equal to one, we do multiply, and remember, D was our private key. Uh, so if I look into the signal, I'll, I can see some pattern like this. Okay, if I see a pattern like this, and if I train it enough, I'll see that I can basically do this. This is, and this would be a square, this would be a multiply, this would be a square, this would be a multiply, this would be a square, this would be a multiply, square, multiply, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now if I want to translate this, this means that for the first try, I had only square, which means that this D was equal to zero, right? So here, D was equal to zero. Then it seems that I repeat this. So I go to the next bit, right? And here I see that there is a square, but it's followed by a multiply. So this means that D was equal to one. Then I see another square multiply. So D was equal to one. Then I see a, the, then I see a square uh, and another square. So here it means that D was equal to zero and D was equal to zero. 
right? And then I can just continue doing that. So what I'm doing here is that, um, and then what is the signal? This is, for example, the power consumption of this processor that I'm running this application on. For example, let's say this is your watch or this is your, your microcontroller. And what I'm doing is I'm measuring the power. And I see a pattern like this. Basically, this red thing that I'm showing is the pattern of the, the power consumption, something like this that goes up and down. And what I see is that if I see a repeating pattern by visually analyzing this, I see these different phases of the program. And then I can kind of map these different phases into the signal that I'm receiving. And when I'm mapping this into the, into the phases, then I can use this information plus the information that I have about the code that I know that, for example, there is a square and there is multiply. And if D is equal to zero, there will be only a square. And if D is equal to one, there's a square and multiply. So I'm going to use all this information to eventually find D. And then as you can see, it's very easy to do that. So it's not that difficult to actually do it. And we call this a simple power analysis because you're you know, doing a simple analysis on the power consumption and I can, I can launch this attack. Any questions? Here's another example. Uh, so this is the function functionality of ping. Okay, uh, you know, do you call ping in your in your uh, in your uh, operating system? Uh, and this is the signal that we are getting from voltage. Again, this is power, and this is over time. And as you can see, you see like visually, you see patterns, right? You see that there is kind of like seems like like things going on here, and they're kind of like another pattern here, and then there's another pattern here. If you actually try to map this in terms of timing with the code, you will see that, for example, this is the packet creation time. This is the time it takes for the server to respond. This is the calculation of the delay in order to 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 know what's the like you know the the, the bit rate or the bandwidth and so on and so forth. So by looking at the physical signal, I can actually distinguish different spaces and different times. How can I use this, for example? I can use this for things like I can measure the delay. I can, I can know how far you are from the server, for example, right? So I can find your location, or I can find the location of the server, or maybe I can find the, the, the content of the packet. I can do different things depending on the use case. But what I want to show you is that by just simple analysis, I can see that there is a very easy way to kind of distinguish different phases in the program, okay? And the third one is, is for something like AES or, or DES. Uh, if I run the entire DES or AES, I'll see like something like this, okay? So for example, I see some, some activity at the beginning and then I see kind of repetitive patterns. And this is basically the part that's, you know, remember we had different rounds, right? So this is basically where the rounds are, okay? And as you can see, for example, I can count how many rounds and what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna actually zoom in into them and maybe even find more information. So again, simple analysis can give you information about different phases of your program. These different phases might actually give you additional information, including the key in RSA. For, for something like ping, you can know whether or not, you know, how long does it take to like ping a particular server, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Any questions? All right. So the challenge with simple analysis is that it's simple, okay? <laughs> so if you have an advanced program that has many different phases, or if actually somebody knows that, you know, you do something like simple analysis, what they might to do is trying to make things a little bit similar, okay? Or trying to kind of like, you know, change these things so that they're not too obvious that you're doing different things. Okay, for example, if, if, I, if you look here, although I can tell which round it is, I cannot really tell the difference between each round, okay, right? So, so simple analysis is good for telling me some information, but not all the information that I want, okay? So what I can do next is making it more sophisticated, and that's where the idea of differential analysis or DPA comes into the play, differential power analysis. So differential power analysis is kind of like a little bit complicated and involved. So I'm going to go through the algorithm first, 
give you an example and then come back to the algorithm and describe it one more time, okay? So here's how the differential analysis works. Uh, differential analysis starts with an assumption about the unknown value. Remember, we wanted to know what X is, right? So we're gonna make some assumption. For example, if X is a binary value, we're gonna say X is equal to zero. Uh, then we're gonna somehow classify, like we're gonna run lots and lots of different inputs. And we're gonna collect this inputs and classify this inputs based on this value, okay? I'm gonna describe how do we do the classification, but let's say I, I'm gonna say that I want to know what X is. I'm gonna run thousands different experiments. And based on some selection function, I'm gonna say this 500 is for, for the case where X was equal to zero. This 500 is for the case that X was equal to one, okay? I'm gonna use some logic to do that. Then I'm gonna compare the differences, the average differences or the differential between the two groups, okay? So if I do that, two things can happen. The first is when I'm doing this uh, kind of differentiation, when I'm doing this classification, if my assumption about X was completely incorrect, what would have happened is that I just randomly grouping two things. So I was, I was thinking that I have some logic, but in reality, I didn't have a particular logic. I was just blindly putting things into two groups. So what would I expect as the difference between two groups? If the inputs are random, and if I just randomly selecting and putting them in two different groups, then their average should be exactly the same because I'm just sampling a random distribution. The, the average of two, you know, two group of samples should be exactly the same. So if I have one group and if I have another group, I'm just randomly you know, putting them into two groups, their difference should be almost zero. But the moments that I actually make the correct decision, the moment that I actually make a correct assumption and then group them together, now, if I you know, do the averaging and differentiate them, there will be a big pick, you know, big spike in, in the difference between the two. And that spike is where this signal is correlated to that signal that I'm looking at. Okay, a little bit confusing. So let me actually give you a, a more concrete example. Okay, so let's say we have like an AES or triple DES as a, as a crypto algorithm. So I'm showing here is a triple DES, uh, which is something very similar to AES. Uh, the way it works is that it also goes through rounds, usually 16 rounds. And what I'm showing here is the last round, okay? So this is the beginning of the last round. It goes through like different steps here that I'm gonna describe. And this would be your final ciphertext, okay? So triple DES is kind of working into like left and right groups. So this is the left part of the final round. This is the right part of the final round. The way this works is that this right part actually goes directly into their ciphertext. So actually this part's kind of substituted and goes to here. So this and this is exactly the same. This left part though, it would be the inputs of the right part that goes through some form of different things. Uh, those different things, uh, you don't need to know the details. But really what is happening is that this goes into some form of mapping, expansion. Then it will be XOR with the key. And this is the round key. And then it goes to the some form of mapping and S box. Then it will be XOR with the left board. And that would be the output of the Socrates. Okay. Generally, that's how this will work. Okay. So why I'm telling you this, let's actually do the differential power analysis on this. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna use this very, very you know, clever trick, okay? So I'm gonna do this. I don't like the eraser. Uh, so I'm gonna say that let's focus on this last bit of L16. And then I'm gonna do something like a divide and concur. I'm gonna say, I want to know what this last bit is. And if I can know that, and if I can basically predict this key, I can break this algorithm, okay? So what I'm gonna do is that this key 16, let's say this is like eight bits, okay? So in order to know that whether this is zero or one, I, I know this values uh, because I know this ciphertext, right? So I know this, so I know all these bits here, right? 
Uh, I'm going to generate various different inputs. So I'm going to, for example, start from one, zero, one, two, and I'm going to like feed it into my triple desk and I'm going to get ciphertext one and ciphertext two and ciphertext three and so on and so forth. Okay. So now I'm looking at ciphertext one and I'm looking on the left side of ciphertext one. And I know that these bits are basically this bits. All right. So I know this input here. Okay. Since I know this input and I know the algorithm, I know what this value is as well, okay? So now I don't know what T is, right? So that's where I'm gonna start brute forcing. I'm gonna say that, okay, for now, let's assume that key 16 is just all zeros, okay? So if it's all zeros, I know this number, I know this number, I don't know this number, but I know the output of this, since I know the output of this because I see the ciphertext, I now I know this and this, and now I can know this as well, right? So for one assumption of the key, I can basically assume what uh, this last bit of uh, L16 is, okay? But remember, I'm just assuming what the key is, right? So I'm not correctly guessing or incorrectly guessing, okay? But for this C1, Based on k equal to all zero, I'm going to divide this C's into groups, okay? And say that, okay, some of these will result in the B is equal to zero. I'm going to put it in group one. Some of these will result in B equal to one. I'm going to put it in group B, okay? So now what I'm going to do? What I'm going to do now is that if I look into the power, I see different patterns, right? So what do I expect to see from the patterns? If you look at the bits, you see that everything is the same except this last bit is either zero or one. Everything else is randomly distributed. So in terms of power consumption, those that goes into group one should be all similar except that their last bit should be equal to zero. So there probably there should be at some point in this uh, you know, time domain powered signal, at some point there should be zero, uh, you know, activities that is depends on B equal to zero. And at some point in some others that are group one, uh, there should be uh, some activities that is relevant to B is equal to one, okay? And everything else is the same. So if I actually, you know, average these two groups, I'll see, for example, this is the average for group one, this is average for group zero. If I subtract this together, if I'm actually correctly, you know, grouping these things together, I should see everything is the same, except there is one area that there's, there's a big jump. And that's where this B is either equal to zero or B equal to one, okay? Because I'm assuming this fact that the power signal that I'm measuring is F, it has some correlation with the bits that I'm, you know, processing, right? And I already told you that there exists this correlation, right? If there are more bit flips, there are more powers, so I should see more activity, okay? So if I actually correctly group them together, I should see this. If I don't group them together correctly, then I'm just randomly grouping them. So I should see the exact same thing. So I should see a flat line in terms of the power consumption, okay? So how do I relate this? So I'm gonna start with key zero, zero, zero. I'm gonna do the grouping. I'm gonna see whether I see a flat line or I see a jump. If I see a flat, flat line, it means that my key was wrong. And only out of, you know, if this is for example, eight bits from zero to, you know, 255, only one of these keys is gonna give me the correct answer, okay? Because only one of the keys is correct. So out of this 256 attempts, 250 of, 255 of them would be a flat line and only one of them would be a big jump. And that is your correct key, okay? So that's kind of like the clever idea that how you do the differential power analysis. You basically by just, and then you can repeat this for the other bits as well, doesn't matter. Uh, as long as there is a correlation between whether I'm processing zero or one in this bit and whether I'm seeing the signal in the output, then I will see the difference, okay? 
And I'm not assuming anything else about the system. I'm just creating random inputs. I know nothing about the intermediate levels. I know nothing about the keys. And that's the only thing that I do. And then the only fact is the search space for this key is, is manageable. For example, it's eight bits or 16 bits. So I can actually do it in a manageable way. Does that make sense? But then how do you know it's you are getting the correct answer? So you know the parameters, right? Then you know like what for given keys and what should be the correct. No, how do you know that? So for example, I'm giving you C1, C2, all the way to C1000. Okay then how do you know that your intermediate values are actually the key that you're using? Because your key is not just the last round, is all the rounds before it as well, right? So the only thing that you see is this ciphertext here. How do you know that this sub key that you're using is actually, yes, if I give you the input and an output and a key, the full key, then you can check whether this leads to that. Sure. But remember, here is this only the sub key, only the 16 key 16s that I'm giving you this. I'm not giving you the whole key. So how do you want to check that whether this is a correct result or not? And then the interesting thing about this is that now that I find key 16, then I can jump one level up. Now I can find key 15 and 14 and 13 and so on and so on. Don't actually need to find all of those, do you? Because if you reduce the key length, you're going to reduce the complexity of the yeah. group force. And then you can do group force, but I mean, this is easier than group force. That's what I'm saying. Question. Um, do we also have L and R? You don't have L and R. You only see C. But you know that R16 is the left part of your C. So essentially, you know R, but you don't know L. Because L is within the algorithm and you don't have access within the system. You only have access to the inputs and you have access to the outputs. But you were saying that there's like one, one or zero. Like I'm just assuming that this is one or zero, right? So I don't know whether it's one or zero, but I know that if I know this and I, I assume something about key, I know this, I know this, so I can know what this is based on some assumption about the key. Right, so I'm kind of like back propagates through the, that bit. One question was there any? Oh, good. Any other questions? All right, so I'm gonna leave you. Uh, so this is just another kind of full picture of this. You actually collect the signals. You make some assumption about the key. You classify it into true groups. And then if you actually made a correct assumption about the key, you will see this change. If you're not making a correct assumption, you will see a line. And that's how you actually can tell that the biggest use case of your side channel signal is telling you that you are actually making the correct decision, right? Everything else is just brute force. The power side channel will give you this indication that you are you know, having the correct answer. That's really the key. The important part, that's the extra information that the side channel is really giving. Okay. Uh, the difference between simple and differential is that, you know, differential is really complex. You don't know where you are looking at and it suddenly appears, right? So, uh, and, and gives you a little bit more complexity and so on. Most of the time you need a combination of both of them to actually attack. And as you will see that actually none of them actually these days work. What you need to do is a more sophisticated attack that we call template attack. So I'm going to talk about it in the next time, but definitely go back and 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 try to parse this uh, to make sure that you kind of understand it. Next Wednesday, I'm going to come back to this and I'm going to talk, it, talk about it again, all right? So don't forget about your project and we're going to see you on Monday with your quiz. Oh, participation.
Uh, so the the creator of this differential power analysis is this guy called, called Paul Kutcher. He's actually a very famous scientist. Uh, the password today is Kutcher. Nope. Yeah. I Yeah, Okay. 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 Okay.